تو نشانگی کمپانیو تو شو Okay, let's do the four limitless contemplation. May all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness which can never be tainted by suffering. May they attain universal impartial compassion free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. Sem jen dam je dewa tang de we ju tang den pa ju je dung gal tang dung gal ju ju tang tra wa ju je dung gal me pe dewa tam pa tang min ra wa ju je ne ring chak tang ni tang tra we jen po la ne pa ju je. So nice to see Scotland back. Nice to see Amanda back. All of you back. It's nice and mummy. So today we are carrying on with Gary Dorje's statements, which open our heart to full awareness. Now, what I realized from from studying this is, the more I study it, the more I read about it, the more I look at it. The more I get to understand it, the more I ponder it, the more profound it actually becomes. It just grows in you. If you think that it's just three statements, you're wrong. What Tuku Urjan Rinpoche said was this. He said, one great master said, all the thousands of books and scriptures are taught for the sole purpose of realizing these Three words. Unbelievable. Okay, just for realizing it. And that's what I realized. To just start, for those of you that haven't been playing around with them, to just go to the three statements, and then I'm going to tell you something else. So the first statement, when Gareth Dorje left for his disciple, when he was in his rainbow body of light, and his disciple got this casket and all the meaning came into him. So in the, in the point number one is one is introduced directly to one's own nature. This is probably the most profound thing. And I'm going to go into this in a lot of detail. I'm going to go into all of them in a lot of detail because actually what I realize is that as you study them and as you understand them and then you take it home, even if you just ponder one sentence when you're at home, you'll start to realize that that introduction to your true nature is everything in your life. Once you get it, and we're giving it here in an understanding, I'm trying to make you understand it. Once you understand it, then you go to experience, then you go to realization. Once you go to realization, Goodbye, samsara, and all your earthly incarnations. So it's one of the most important things, and it's called in Buddhism the view. The view. The view or the base is the most important thing. One of the Zogchen trainings is in Trekchor, and in Trekchor, it's one of the high trainings of the Zogchen, you actually learn how to how to actually be in that pure state, how to directly introduce yourself once the master has given it to you into your true nature. So the view is vital. And you'll see how when we come to the path, the next part, how the view links the three Buddha bodies, the Dharmakaya, Sambhukakaya, and Nirmanakaya, which is everything that you are. You'll see that later on. But the second statement is, one definitively decides upon this unique state, and that is called the path. So you definitively decide. And please, everybody, I have got so many earthly obligations. It seems like my earthly obligations get more and more instead of less and less. But I'm applying this in all my earthly, in all my things, I'm applying this particular this particular idea of one definitively decides on this unique state, because wherever you are, whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, that definitive state, when you decide on it, 
then it applies, and I'll give you examples later, it applies to everything you're doing in your earthly life. So it's a most important. So it's the view. And then the second statement's the path. And the third statement is one continues directly with confidence in liberation. Once you know that, it's so important because you're, you're continuing in absolute confidence that you're going to liberate yourself. And that applies to your life. And that's called the fruition, sometimes called the action. Now, what happened to me um, yesterday, it was a funny thing, I, I'm, over the weekend, I'm trying to take all my files and I'm trying to reduce them. I've got so many files and so many talks and so much written out. And the reason I like to keep them is because sometimes when I come to a similar subject, then I like to take it out and then use some of the material that I had already researched. So I don't have to double research anything. And so when I was going through all my talks and everything, and I don't know how I'm ever going to reduce them, but I'm trying to reduce them. I'm trying to turf stuff out. But I came across this that I even forgot that I had, that I'd done and studied. And it's called Primordial Purity, the Oral Instructions on the Three Words that Strike the Vital Point by Dilgo Kienzi Rinpoche. Okay, now I've got 21 pages of notes on this. I'd forgotten about it when I was teaching on this and I came across it and then I was reading it, but now I was reading it with a different mindset. So I found it so exciting. I found it so interesting. I found it so, um, so wonderful to actually read it. So I thought I've got to take some of it from out of here as well. And that's why this subject can actually go on and on and on, because when you read all the masters, um, what they've said about these three statements, which are your whole life, doesn't really matter, even if I call it something else in the next one. But I can't do this stuff quickly because lots of things are coming to me about it. And I really want to share it with all of you. So what he said, Dilgo Kienzi, he said, what are the three words that strike the vital point. He says, in one day, in one day, sentient beings can go through the view, the meditation or the path, and the action or fruition, which I've just told you about in the three statement, recognize their delusions in one day, recognize their delusion and transform into Buddhas. Okay, he says, the ultimate view, medit view path, which can also be the meditation and action or fruition of Dzogchen, is called striking the vital point. There's nothing else. Now, it's interesting because Andres was talking to me and he went to this lovely Jamtro Rinpoche who was teaching and he asked him, is this part of Dzogchen? And Jamtro said, Everything's part of Zogchen. Everything's part of it because it's how the Buddha taught the Yanas. And right at the top, it's there. And the top includes absolutely everything going up. So he said here, when Manjushra Mitra cried out to Garib Dorje in longing and despair, Garib Dorje gave him key instructions. I told you called the Upadesha. And although Manjushra Mitra had already understood the view and the path or the meditation and the action of Zogchen, now listen to this sentence. The mind lineage merged into one. So important. Because Tati, I often think of you and I think of a few people that are really, really trying to get it and everything. The mind lineage merged into one. That means the mind of the guru and the mind of the disciple are one. It's the final testament is how the transmission is known. So you might go to somebody, they might tell you, a master might tell you, look at the right, and you might get it. They may give you a slap, 
and you might get it. As I gave you those, I gave you all those things in the past talk. How they point it out is completely differently. And Lama Yeshi is always pointing, Lama Yeshi Rinpoche is always pointing out to me and he used the words, he always uses the words, and yet. So when I give him my complaints and my samsari things, he goes, and yet. Okay, then I know what's coming. And yet, what is all of this? And yet, compared to the introduction to your true nature, this is nothing. The suffering is nothing. It's temporary, transient. And I want to hear your opinions. I'm just going to give you a few things so you really get this idea because it's such a beautiful thing. And Dilgo Kienzi says, first of the three words is view. No recognition of the view, no path or meditation, no action. He says the view is the eyes, the eyes. Once you've got the view, once you've been introduced, you've got the eyes, then you can see everything for yourself. To make the view attainable, the Buddha introduced all the yanas, all the levels. And you can go in whatever level you wish. It's really okay. He says, but you have to understand that the view of this Ati Yoga that that Garib Dorje gave Manjushra Mita is a direct realization, the sphere of one's own self-aware wisdom, self-aware, we'll talk about all of this, you can debate with me, beyond words, that's the view. So I'm going to come back to a lot of things in this because I really found such beautiful things in that. But I learned a new term this week from Anam Tukton called Vajra Reasoning. Vajra Reasoning. I'm really sorry Eric isn't here. I don't know why he hasn't been here last week as well. But anyway, Vajra Reasoning really means understanding Beyond ordinary logic, beyond ordinary logic, it's almost like saying awareness without words, without words. Yet, how would the Buddhas teach things to ordinary sentient beings without explanations? It's really a difficult thing. And when you look at him, he said the mind lineage becomes one. There are different lineages in that Atta Yoga. There are different lineages, and the mind lineage is one. The sign lineage is another. They have, they have these different levels of transmission, depending on which lineage you fit and how you get it from the master. But it's strange because very often, and my Teaching in, in the centers and everything is such, a, is such a precious thing that I've got because it really makes me ponder things. And one day when I've got Vajra speech, I'll be able to get it at the level that everybody can understand. But that's why I want to open it. I don't want to rush through this. It's so precious. And at the moment, it's turning my own life inside out. I cannot begin to tell you how much it is turning my life in. The people that I've been meeting lately have had so many functions and occasions and things, and I've just been meeting the right people at the right time. And so it, it impacts my own personal life. And very often when I want to prepare material, so I'm studying what I want to put across, and I think this is so clear it's absolutely amazing and then I come to a group especially at night and it's not the same because I can look around that's why I love you to have your your cameras on because I can look around and I can see who's getting it and who isn't getting it and I don't have a problem with that if you come forward and say I'm not getting what you're saying and please give me a little more or let's talk about it I'm absolutely because it's very, very important that when I come, I often see, geez, what was so clear to me isn't clear. That means a pathetic human being, sentient being, 
who is still functioning on the level of an ordinary sentient being, that's me, but who does a lot of a lot of pondering, a lot of practice, and a lot of everything to try and get it across to you. But Vajra reasoning is cutting through to the essence. And it means people often get it at their own level because it's Vajra speech. Now, I wish that I had Vajra speech, and I certainly don't even have an inkling of Vajra speech. But what is very interesting to me is using these three points, using Garib's Dorje's teaching, seems to put me in different places at the exact time that I need to be there. And that's the beginning of the development when it applies to your everyday life. But if you don't do any practice whatsoever, it's really difficult to apply it to your everyday life because you don't have the base. My day starts with full on practice. So my mind is tuned to that. So then that enables me to go on doing it. And Zongsa Rinpoche explains that when the Buddha coughed, even his cough was Vajra speech because he coughed. The doctor heard it and the doctor thought, hmm, this is this kind of cough that needs this and this and this. So he used his cough for that. An old woman heard him cough and she said, interesting where this cough comes from. And in that moment of Vajra speech, she put together causes and effects landing up in the cough. And she understood. So I'm just, he's saying like a cough can be, there you go, a cough of a Buddha, of an awakened person can, can be Vajra speech. It's so fascinating. So when you really understand these three points, you have to go beyond logic to even begin the view that these three have for everything we need in our spiritual journey, plus, plus our earthly temporary roles we're playing in this lifetime. They are mysterious, yet totally down to the points that cut to the bone. So I just want to say, I'll throw it open and you debate with me. It's lovely to see Viam with his wife. I'm very happy you're here today. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's very important that this week I've sat, this last week I've sat with several people who feel overwhelmed by the present circumstances of their lives. And I've used Lama Yeshi's term and said to all of them, and yet, okay, because yet means you're going into Vajra reasoning, not the things that are really pulling you down together, okay? And I said, and yet you actually have everything if you know your awakened Buddha nature that knows. The awakened Buddha nature knows. It's aware of why you're in that situation. I try and explain this to so many people because they can't understand why they're in this situation when they're trying so hard or they're doing it. And I go, get it. You created this a long time ago. Now just be happy. Be happy. What does the Buddha nature know? The Buddha nature knows why you are in this situation and what a great opportunity, open portal to unity it is to unite with your Buddha nature. Because in the sorrow and in all your things, it really gives you the most incredible explanations. It's your wealth. It is your solution to be right there in the midst of traumatic circumstances and yet derive so much. Derive what, people ask me. I go, purification of your repetitive imprints, the depth and the understanding of the human condition, an opportunity to relate to people, to touch their hearts like never before. You've got all of that in your pain. Now, I have to tell you the story of what happened to me last week because it's a beautiful story and I think it illustrates this. It's a live story, okay? What happened was 
the hairdresser that I appear in about once every, I don't know, eight weeks, two months, three months, whatever. The, the young woman, she's not so young, I think she's already nearly 50, but the, or in her 40s, but she had this child that was given to her um, at three months. It was actually her brother's child, and it was passed on to her because the wife didn't want to look after the child, and the brother couldn't. So he gave it to his sister, who tried to have children and couldn't. And so out of the blue, this baby was presented to her, and she says she went through snot and trying to bringing her up. You know, she didn't have a lot of money or anything anyway. So it was her and this child. So at about, uh, how old was her child? Last year at about 16, was I think the child was about 16, maybe a little bit older. The child suddenly died. Okay. So this one child that she had suddenly died. Okay, well, I don't have to tell you how she felt. But um, it's interesting because I went soon after the child had died. I happened to be there. And the hairdresser, who's a very spiritual person as well, she just said, listen, I'm leaving you with her. I don't know how when I'm going there and I'm supposed to just be sitting and reading the news or something, I get to have these people. But there she was. And so in December, I took her right through a process of what bereavement is, the anger, the pain, the everything, all of that. And so interesting, because when I saw her last week, she remembered every single word that I said in December. It's so amazing because, you know, I see people often very regularly and they don't remember anything I've actually said and I can repeat it a thousand. She remembered every single word. And I said to her last week, so you really, 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 it gets harder before it gets better. And she said, yes, yes, yes. Anyway, the hairdress is very diplomatic. She goes out and I'm able to have time with her. So this is what I told her. Now, this is where I want to bring in Garib Dorje's statement about confidence in, libera in liberation and definitely deciding on a unique state of who we are. So this is what I did, and I did it totally spontaneously. I said to her, listen, I want you to write your story. I said, get a scrapbook. And write your story. And let's call it the gift. She says, the gift. I've lost the gift. I said, I know. But let's examine it. So I made her sit there and I imagined we were writing this story together, the gift. Okay. And I said, once there was this woman who couldn't have children, blah, blah, blah. She was, she was just absorbed totally. And then one day. The universe knocked on her door and gave her a gift. Maybe the universe forgot to tell her that the gift was only temporary and it was only for a short period of time. And one day when the universe or God, as she believes, she's a Christian, came and took the baby, took the baby away or the baby had to go, the child had to go, she was left bereft. But she knew somehow this was a very, very special gift. And I said, you need to put in your story all your pictures, all your everything. And now we need to examine what is the gift. I said, now, even though you have this terrible pain in your heart, you have a richness beyond all people. I said, you have an understanding of children and they're suffering, and people suffering. I said, and you need to take this temporary gift and give it to the world. I said, you have many, many people in this country. So she started to say to me, actually, my neighbor hasn't got any food, and I always take the little bit I've got, and I go and share it with her. I said, exactly. Now you have to share with children, and you have to make your gift 
into a much richer gift than this one child. Anyway, to end this beautiful story, because she's so excited about her book, but she wants me to write it with her. I said, no, 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 it's your story. You must write it. I'll help you, but you must write it. It's your story. Write it in your language. Draw pictures, put photos, do whatever you need to. But the story ends not even better. That Leia, who works for the Rockpa, the Rockpa um, Foundation in Nepal, she's in Nepal, they lost a child in their, in, their, in their home, in one of their homes where she'd taken these poverty-stricken children, educated them and all of that. And one of the children died. So she wrote to me and she said to me, we are so bereft and we are so absolutely feel terrible. And she says, we don't know what to do with it. We, we're so awful. And I said, well, you do know what to do with it. And this week, she sent me pictures, first of all, of all the other children that she was loving. Now, you know, her story is so interesting because Akon Wimpeche, when she asked him um, a long time ago, should she have any children? He said, no, why have one of your own children? You're gonna have so many children when you do this work. So rather have all the children in the world. So there's a picture of her with all these children. And then she says, guess what, Melanie? We got seven new children this week. So she's got a picture of her with all these little children all surrounding her and her in the middle and all of them lying on her. They've now found a place to go from their poverty and everything. So I took these pictures and I sent it to this woman. And I said, now look, look what the gift is really about. And for me, and she was so excited, but then she sent me a, an audio. She said, but Melanie, you've got to write the story with me. I'll put it in my own language. I said to her, I will send you an audio giving you all ideas how to write the story. But this is your story, not mine. I've got a different story to tell. But what was so beautiful is that this picture came into being this week when I had just seen her. So giving her the picture was just the perfect rounded. Now that is called Garib's Dorje's absolute introduction to your nature, having confidence in liberation, first deciding on the unique state of who we are, and then having confidence in liberation. Liberation comes from realizing that this pain is a gift. And that is where we go on the journey. So, so important. Do you all understand? You want to say something? You're all sitting as quiet as lambs. Okay. I love it when I see their faces. Anyone want to ask or say something? Just your own heart comments. Surely, okay. isn't that, I'll say oh. something. Isn't that everything is a gift if we see it and we stop and you know and you know appreciate and then give because we get a gift, we should give it as well. But the thing is, sometimes we're not aware, you know, we have to be awake and aware. But, yeah, but isn't that the story of luck that we haven't got yes. away? Isn't that a, such a sad story that we're not aware of what we're doing? And that's why this teaching is probably the most profound teaching you can get because yes. we're not aware. And this is training yes. us to, be, to become aware that everything is not the way it's supposed <coughs> to be. Yes. Any, we haven't seen you for a long time. What have you got to say? Um, I, I just wish I had you with me every day, Melanie, just to um, guide me through each day. <laughs> you have got your own nature with you every day. You've got everything you need. I just work hard to really make it work. But it's so beautiful because all the time people are in front of me that need to be there at that moment. I don't say they take it in. But I can't do the old rubbish work that I used to do with the basic of psychology. I have to look at people and really try and change them. Now, 
that was that was a totally spontaneous thing that happened and it's hit the core of this woman it's really unbelievable now she's not going to come and learn but she's got that connection with me which will take her through many lifetimes now until she can liberate herself but that's your important point with people that's really your important point so it's really all of us that can actually understand this and then i want to read you a very special story which which goes with all of this okay and then you can imagine how far we'll get with the teachings i haven't even started with took urgent's article which was my original intention to to give you it's called the sound of one hand the master of kenan temple was mokurai silent thunder he had a little protege named toyo who was only 12 years old toyo saw the older disciples visit the master's room each morning an evening to receive instruction in zazen or personal gardens in which they were given cones those are those those mystery puzzles and things to stop mind wandering toyo wished to do zazen also wait a while said mukura you're too young but the child insisted so the teacher finally consented in the evening little toyo went at the proper time to the threshold of mukura's zazen room He struck the gong to announce his presence, bowed respectively three times outside the door, and went to sit before the master in respectful silence. You can hear the sound of two hands when they clap together," said Mukura. "Now show me the sound of one hand." Toyo bowed, no problem, and went to his room to consider this problem. And from his window, he could hear the music of the geishas. Oh, I have it! He proclaimed. The next evening, when his teacher asked him to illustrate the sound of one hand, he began to play the music, beautiful music of the geishas. No, no, said Mukura. That will never do. This is not the sound of one hand. You've not got it at all. Thinking that such music might interrupt, Toyo moved his abode to a quiet place. He meditated again. What can the sound of one hand be? He happened to hear some water dripping. Oh, I have it! You see, he's imagined Toyo. When he next appeared before his teacher, Toyo imitated dripping water. What is that? Asked Mokura. That is the sound of dripping water, but not the sound of one hand. Try again. In vain, Toyo meditated to hear the sound of one hand. He heard the sighing of the wind, but the sound was rejected. He heard the cry of an owl. This was reviewed. The sound of one hand was not the locust. For more than ten times, Toyo visited Mokura with different sounds. All were wrong, and so for almost a year he pondered what the sound of one hand could be. At last, little Toyo entered true meditative path and transcended all sounds. I could collect no more. He explained it later. So I reached the soundless sound. Toyo had realized the sound of one hand, which is silent. Now that soundless sound is so important in this. It's what I was calling about Vajra reasoning. It's not a sound that you know, but it's a sound you really, really do know if you listen. properly with the inner ear you'll know that true sound because it's a soundless sound now me having cheek i once went to taisitu rinpoche and i said to <clears throat> taisitu rinpoche please explain to me the soundless sound so he laughed said well tell me when you have it because i really want to understand he said Oh well, when I go on an airplane, he said, I put my head back like this, and you can imagine because he's always got millions of people coming to him, so it's really a pleasure when he gets on an airplane. No one's disturbing him, and he puts his head back. He said, and I hear it, not the sound of the airplane, not the sound of the people, the 
the soundless sound. Now, when you actually look at that, it's amazing. Because if you sit very, very quietly, you hear it. And then it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. When you die, you hear the soundless sound and it is so loud because you haven't got your physical appearance that it's called the sound of a thousand thunderclaps because it's so loud. I think the sound that comes nearest to it are when you're in a forest and the cicadas are, have you ever heard when the cicadas are with their, sound, with their noise? It's like a noiseless noise, you know. That soundless sound because you have Vajra, Vajra body, Vajra speech, Vajra, Vajra mind. Vajra speech, and we'll talk about that in the path. Vajra speech is that soundless sound. It's beyond speech. It's beyond words. It's beyond everything. And if you just go, if you just block your ears now, you'll hear a little bit of it. I've told you this before. Just block your ears tight. Push them in. Can you hear it? There's a sound there, which is the soundless sound, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The more we go to Vajra speech and we use our energy in a different way, the more that sound is loud and it's not a sound. And that was the story, which is really amazing. So I want to do a meditation. I want to go back to the contemplation. But I want you to um, I want you to ask me if there's anything you want to know or hear or whatever, anybody, or anything you want to comment about what I'm saying. It's really important. You all okay? I think you have to do more meditation and go more within to hear the in a voice, isn't it? I think we do. I think we do. But you see, I just want to say this, that um, a lot of people in all my groups now, a lot of people are like saying, you know, they get so restless when they meditate and they can't meditate for long periods of time and that kind of thing. That's because we have such a strange expectation about meditation. We think if we sit in this absolute perfect position you know and we get to shamata shamata just gets your mind to calm down nothing else when you look in that's when you actually discover anything but the bottom line is it's the meditation of your life that is important because all you're doing in the state of contemplation is you're getting in touch with your own intrinsic self-existing awareness that's what you're getting in touch with you can be going on a walk and you can get in touch with it you can have a beautiful moment with someone and you can get in touch with it we need to apply this of course we need to do some practice only for one reason to get us to the point beyond practice that's the only reason we have to do practice because we need to get there, but we need to use this. My mission this year is not just to give you millions of meditation techniques and everything. It's to get you to start being aware in your life. I'd say that's what does meditation, to be yeah. more and more aware. It wakes you up. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And when you are aware, then you know what is going on in your life and why it is going on. It's so important. Very and it's important. so clear, yes. So, I, clear. so yes. clear. But most people don't because they think that they think that doing this or doing all of these things, you have to be in some high place. But actually you don't. Actually, you don't have to be in a high place at all. You need to be in a normal place. And a lot of those masters go, listen, 
it's not extraordinary, this state. It's actually your natural state. But mm. we don't get into it because we're so busy conniving, judging, evaluating, planning, plotting. We don't get to it. So let's do it now, if my dogs will please be quiet. No. But even when they don't, yes, Vian, please. Jack and Yeshi, shush. We don't want you barking. Yeah. Uh, it's my mother, it's not my wife. Thanks, Amelia. It's your mom. I didn't see it. That's, that's so beautiful. Are no you problem. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, that's so nice, Tammy. I thought it was your wife. I mean, I haven't seen her for so long. I can't remember what she's like. But you're such a young mother. I mean, really <laughs> thank you okay, i can see you look like a young mother like a sister rather than a mother go on vm well i wanted to ask or just put it um the that gift that you're talking about and the and that kind of how we approach that gift would that fall into like the third point of the of the fruition like once we, for for us who are like on the buddhist path once we have that um the view and that direct, or at least I haven't had experience of the primordial nature, then deciding this is our part, doing the practice. Then from there, we view everything on as like a gift. So it's the same as like, like so like to recognize um, what it have is everything self liberates, you know, so so everything that that might be seen, or you might think it's a bad thing, like like this lady saw it as a bad thing, it, it can be a gift because everything can be brought onto the path of fruition. Exactly. It's a. It's actually in all three statements, yeah. because like you can say, being introduced to the nature of mind. Okay, you then become aware. Okay, with awareness, you start to see things differently, but you definitively decide that you're going to see this differently. You're going to see it in the view. Okay, and then with that. You've got confidence in liberation. Suddenly, when you've got a terrible story in your life and you're really upset and everything, you have now see it in a different way. I mean, I really am so, so all three points it actually gets at. And I'm so fascinated, you know. I used to often think how Akon Rinpoche and, and Lama Yeshi Rinpoche, when they left Tibet, Every week or two, the Chinese went and tortured their parents. Now, I think of that. I think to myself, if that happened to me, I probably would go back and surrender myself to the Chinese instead of having run away from Tibet. But I actually thought, how can they bear it? How can they bear this to think that because they left, now their parents are getting unbelievably tortured every couple of weeks and their parents are not getting younger and, you know, they're getting tortured. I thought, how do they bear it? With these three statements, okay, they can bear it and it does become a gift because everything in life is temporary, transient, impermanent, an illusion. Now, I know when you're going through really hard times, it doesn't seem like an illusion, okay? It doesn't seem at all like an illusion, but it really, really, really is. It's the most amazing thing. I've been watching this movie, um, Do You Like Brahms? Or something, some, it's called something like Do You Like Brahms? And it's on the Korean it's about Koreans and their culture and everything. And I love what they do, how they bow to each other, all these kind of things. But just, and it's all about these musicians and what happens to them in their life. I like it. My husband's a bit bored with it, but I really like it because I'm watching what happens to them in their life and everything. How the one becomes a famous pianist and he's so unhappy inside himself and the other one's dying to become a violinist and she's not very good at the violin, you know? And, and, and how we all, in the exact place we need to be at the exact time, that's what is so amazing in these three points. Because once you've got confidence in that, 
your whole view changes. Once your view changes, this is no thing, nothing. This is no thing. I can just go on and on and on and on, and it's no thing. So it's, it really applies, the gift applies to all things. And what we want to do is we want to be so aware that in every situation where we've got a person that's in dire straits or a person going through this or that or the other, we can allow that true nature of mind to just come into us and be spot on for that person. It's so important. When you open yourself up and you suddenly think, oh my God, what does Melanie know? Melanie knows absolutely nothing. I know a few facts. I've gone to university. What do I know? I know nothing, absolutely nothing. But my nature of mind knows everything. My Buddha awakened nature knows everything. So why not connect with it and let it work through me naturally, spontaneously? That's what I'm really trying to do. And I'm grateful for teaching this material because it's making, it's happening for me. You know, everything's changed. It, Everything it's changed. happening for me as well. Good. I am delighted. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all the teaching. I, I appreciate it. what's happening to you then. I'm so happy. If out of all the people I ever teach, if one gets it during this life, then I've done my work. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Then it's even better, you know. But I mean, we need enlightenment on this planet. This planet's in a yes. very bad way. I mean, we really need enlightenment. That's the only thing that can save this planet. So let's do a little meditation. So just relax your physical body. That's one of the things that are really, really important. The relaxation of your physical body. Because if not, if your physical body is tense, if you're trying too hard, then we charged with psychic energy. And then... It leads to the flow of thoughts being really overwhelming for us. So just take some lovely deep breaths. And as you breathe in, take in beautiful Buddha nature, the spaciousness, the blue color, the absolute openness. And breathe out all your closed statements, your thinking, your, your conniving, your working out, your planning, your movements, just breathe it all out, give it space. I want you to really understand the real state of contemplation. We're not going to go through it. You can get it from last week's, you can get it from last week's teaching. But I just want to go through a few things. The state of contemplation is a state of immediate, immediate, intrinsic awareness. Just a beautiful state of knowing, open, full of possibilities, nothing tangible, but everything allowed. And your thoughts and your actions just come up. Let them, no deliberate calculation, no stopping. No working out. Just let everything be. A calm state when we're not thinking all the time. And the moving state when the thoughts are moving and lots of things are happening. They're all rikpa. And it doesn't matter whether your mind is still 
or calm. Rikpa is not the experience, the temporary experience itself, but the immediate awareness of that experience. That immediate stays with you always. The experience itself is just gone and it stays with you totally. And that's all we need. This immediate awareness is unique. It's the capacity of your nature of mind that is unlimited. And when we see that all our thoughts and passions are just the creative play of the mind, we don't suppress them, we don't interfere with them, we don't distract, but we don't get distracted by them, we don't follow them. We just see them as a continuous display of the beautiful creative energy of primordial awareness. This is the state of contemplation. Nothing to be done except to be totally present. And in the state, your internal awareness and whatever else is happening outside of you, the sound, the thoughts, everything, meet each other and become one. There's no separation between you your state of awareness and all the things that are constantly happening. It's all one. And if we don't see it that way, then we become I looking and dealing with whatever's going around me. Bring it all together in one state of beautiful contemplation, self existing wakefulness, awareness, and keep bringing yourself back to the presence of intrinsic awareness, nothing more, nothing less. And if you're in a turbulent state, take deep breaths, breathe it in, breathe out everything that you don't need, that you really allow it to have.
No, you all froze. I, I, everybody froze in meditation. And I went off for a minute and came back on and all of you were frozen. So I don't know what happened, but it's interesting when it happened during the meditation. So you probably had to freeze in the meditation. Well, I had to and you all just went on. So I just saw all these people sitting in meditation. And then when I brought you back with the gong, nobody could hear me. Mel, we didn't hear any. I, the only thing I heard was the recording has stopped and then I had to come back. That's, that's, what, we, that's what I heard. That's why I switched on and interrupted. I Sorry. don't know. I was looking. Yeah, we, hit, we didn't hear. Yes. So we no, so we didn't hear any gong. We just we just heard recording stopped. Okay. So the recording stopped. Made it and now it's going. Everybody's going to hear the recording stop. No. But it's okay because now you're back. And anyhow, it was good that you that it froze during the meditation. It couldn't have been a better time. But I've had all my stuff fixed, you know. I've had everything fixed up, and that shouldn't have happened at all now because I've got really lots of stuff on the go, you know, do, to get this inverted to work properly and everything. Anyway, um, man's and what's happening in yours? Sure, yours is flickering and schmickering. Don't know what it's doing. Don't know. Anyway, let's go back to the thing. Is everyone okay? Are you all okay? Okay. So let's go back to start with Tulku Urgent, and then I'm going to I'm going to move between Tulku Urgent's instructions and the Golden Letters instructions because I think that they together they make the most wonderful, wonderful combination, and you get everything you really need. So when Garib Dorje, and sorry, when Tulku Urgent Rinpoche was talking about striking the vital point, he said. He spoke a lot about that first statement, recognize your own nature. And he said that is Buddha nature itself. Okay, empty. This is what Buddha nature is, the only way we could describe it. And of course, you can't describe it because it's beyond words. But the only way we, we describe it is empty cognizance with a core of compassionate energy. That's the way he describes it, but it can't really be described. But if you want some kind of words to help you, empty cognizance with a core of compassionate energy. That's how the master introduces you. This nature is empty in essence. So when it's empty, it means it means nothing there. Okay, no thing. It's empty. But when you add the naturally cognizant, it means emptiness with awareness. That's what you've got to understand. So the emptiness means it's not, it's, it's absolutely full of possibility. It's like the sky, it's open, it's spacious, but cognizance means it's aware all the time. That is its nature. The awareness never, ever goes away. And he says, these two are indivisible. Because they're indivisible, because you've got this beautiful emptiness with its nature cognizant. So because of that, compassionate activity can go through you. This is, your, this is what, I, what I've been talking about all day today. Because of the empty cognizant nature, compassionate activity can actually go through you. And the first of the three words of Garib Dorje is recognizing your own nature for what it is, says Tulku Urjan. That's the exact pointing out instruction itself. Okay. And when you understand that, Everything arises from this emptiness, from this essence, from this base. But the base, the emptiness has always got awareness. Because the two are indivisible, 
compassionate activity, limitless can happen. Once you understand this, this is the universal ground. This is the universal explanation. He goes, how is the Buddha nature? It's empty in essence. It's cognizant by nature. And its capacity is endowed with a core of compassion, self-awareness, all of these kind of things. And that is what it is. There's no concrete thing with distinguishing characteristics. It's wide open like space. Doesn't fall into a category of nothingness. Because if I said to you, it's just empty, then you'd say, well, what's there? You'd say, there's nothing there. And I'd go, no, emptiness, what is there is cognizance, self-existing self awareness. And so that helps you because if it was emptiness, then a lot of people would go, oh, well, there's nothing. Oh, well, the world is nothing. Oh, well, why shouldn't I just go and get what I want because there's nothing in the world? Wrong. Because it's, it's not nihilistic and it's not eternal in terms of eternalism and nihilism, the two opposite. It is an empty essence which is full of possibility with an awareness which together bring forward all that compassionate activity. Very, very, very clear. And he says to his students, what do you see when I ask you to see your mind? So they all close their eyes and they look and he says, well, what do you see? They go, we don't see a thing. There's nothing to see. He says, right. So <laughs> that's because your mind is free from the limitation of something that is. Of course, there's nothing to see. But it's also not non-existent because, he says, if I clap my hands, then you can all hear there's a sound. There's something. So there's not nothing and there's not something. There's both together. He says, if the mind were non-existent, then you wouldn't be able to hear the sound. So that's how you don't fall into the trap of nothingness. Because the nothingness has cognizance. That's why you can hear when I clap with both hands. You can hear the sound. He says, so you look at it that existence and non-existence are a unity. And that's really important. It's called the view beyond intellect or concept. And it's also called another word, which I use a lot. And that word is thatness. Have you heard that word before in any of your reading or writing? Thatness, the thatness of something. And what does thatness mean? It means just that. I love that word thatness. Use it. If your, parent, if your children say, what can I do? You go, thatness. It just is. <laughs> okay. And then they look at you as though you're mad. But thatness is so interesting because it's another one of those Vajra reasoning. Thatness. It means there isn't anything tangible. And yet there is something. So it's not tangible and it's not something. You get all these contradictions all the time, all the time. It's so interesting because you must take these contradictions and meditate on them. You know, I've been listening to Zongsa Kienzi Rinpoche, and I was telling them about him at night. He's, he's so terrific. And he says, think of the word common sense. Now you say to your children, you go to your children, um, Use your common sense when they say, Ma, how do I put this on? How do I do this? Use your common sense and work it out, okay? What is common sense? Actually, common sense is common to the human part of the mind. It's not at all common to your real nature. Common sense is ridiculous because... The common sense we use is all the training we've got in our ordinary minds, our ordinary nature. That's what common sense is. Do you need it? You probably do need it to go through samsara, but is it really vital? No. Common sense does not go beyond reasoning. And in this, he says, they go, Buddha nature is, is non-existent. 
yet there's something. So he says, you get all these contradictions and then you go, how can I understand it? I don't understand how it is. How can it be like that? You know, it's very interesting because you can't use your human analytical ordinary mind to understand these things, the self-existing awareness, the intrinsic awareness, you can't think it out. It has no logic. But because the Buddha was compassionate to us, he explained it on dot, lots of levels so we could understand it. Talk to me, say something, because I'm going to give you the golden letters explanation for this now. Talk to me. Anyone. Do you understand what I'm saying? Good bits. Well, at least your little head is, is, is nodding. Anyone else understand what I'm saying? Listen, it's hard to understand because you can't use your human nature. You've got to use something beyond to understand all this and to change your whole life. And that's what I've got to do to put across to people my whole life. So let's go through the golden letters, but you're all very quiet and you must butt in. Because if you don't understand it, then you'll never, you'll never be able to get it. So mind, your ordinary human mind, and the nature of mind. Okay, so we call it the nature of mind. It's called sem ni. And the ordinary mind, your human mind, is called sem. The ordinary mind is the incessant flow of all your discursive thoughts, which continually arise. That is your mind or your ordinary mind or your thought person. And in his introduction, now the golden letters gives you this introduction. So if you can get this, I'll really be happy because that's how the introduction comes. It's not logical. But it gives you analogies, signs, symbols, so you can understand. So this is what he says in the golden letters of Patro Rinpoche's introduction. He says, in his introduction, but in when you don't understand, the master likens our nature of mind to a highly reflective mirror. So he says, your mind is like a mirror. Can you give a mirror? Your mind is like a mirror, a highly reflective mirror. If you want it to be really technical, those of you who do, it's like a crystalline holographic mirror. And this nature of this mirror is clear clarity purity, and transparency. If I take an ugly sign and I put it in front of the mirror, the mirror will reflect it. If I take a beautiful sign and put it in front of the mirror, the mirror will also reflect it. It will reflect anything. If I put my watch in front of this mirror, you'll see my watch. It is a, this nature of mine is a highly reflective holographic mirror or crystalline mirror and it's clear it's absolutely clear it's absolutely pure it's absolutely transparent you can't hide anything from this mirror it knows all our thoughts and our feelings and our impulses and our emotions are like the reflections in this mirror. Now, if you saw something in a mirror, you know you can't go and get it because it's just a reflection. Okay? So our mind reflects whatever it is. This is how the master introduces you to your nature of mind. And so, what is intrinsic awareness? What is our awareness? Our awareness is being in a state of immediate presence. And that is exactly, this is a symbol he gives you. 
like this mirror. This mirror has the capacity, the intrinsic awareness has the capacity to reflect whatever is set before it, good or bad, pure or impure, beautiful or ugly. This mirror doesn't say when an ugly person comes in, yeah, you're so ugly, I don't want to reflect you. It just reflects. It doesn't do anything like that. That is what your nature of mind. And just as all these reflections, whether they protest in the street, whether they Putin limping around bombing Ukraine, whether they are somebody shouting at someone else, whether they are two lovers, whatever they are, these reflections in no way change or modify the nature of the mirror. Nothing can change it. It doesn't crack because there's a lousy reflection in it. It just carries on reflecting. So in no way do all our ugly thoughts, even if we want to murder anyone, whatever we want to do that arise in our mind, they don't change or modify the nature of mind. Just as this mirror never changes when all the reflections are gone. When integrated into the knowledge of this intrinsic awareness, we start to live in the condition of the nature of the mirror, okay? But if we lack awareness and we remain in ignorance, we live in the condition of the reflections. That's your choice. That's how the master introduces you. Do you want to live in the condition of the mirror, which is not affected by the reflections? Or do you want to live in the reflections, thinking that whatever they are, they're real and substantial? Okay? That's our choice. Now, let me say something else. And then you have to talk to me. Because if you don't talk to me, oh, any other... <coughs> The session's going to be over in two minutes. So let me just finish now. These reflections, how were they originally? So when we were all enlightened, living in a golden age, what were these reflections like? Well, let me get you news from the golden letters, which is such a beautiful text. These reflections, originally had the nature of rainbow light. They weren't harsh like they are now. They were rainbow light in the beginning. But because of our ignorance, because of all our negative feelings, obscurations, gradually they changed from rainbow light to coarse things, hard things, substance things, and they became the material world surrounding us. And you know what else? Because we weren't using the nature of the mirror, we got attached to all these things. This is mine. Don't touch it. This belongs to me. This is mine. Don't touch it. I'm attached to it. We got attached to all those reflections. Instead of just letting them be, they were supposed to be in beautiful color. And then they became hard and we started to want them and become attached to them. And so samsara began. Okay? And all this came because of a lack of knowledge or wisdom that we didn't have. We didn't know we were the nature of mind anymore. Now, it's very interesting because it says here wisdom or yeshe, yeshe. The word yeshe, I'll come back to it another time, but I listened to Zongsa Rinpoche talking about the word yeshe. It's the most, my little dog's called yeshe, and it's the most beautiful word. Because she, 
means consciousness, living in all the reflections or ordinary consciousness. And ye means before. So actually you get yeshe when you go to the state before all the consciousness started to make these things solid and tangible. We had, we had this wisdom. Okay. And it's so interesting. I won't go on, but remember it's the same mirror, the same nature of mind that reflects the beautiful rainbow color or the other things. It's beyond time. It's beyond past, present, and future. It's in the fourth time. And it's so interesting because we have to learn to live in this essence. I'm just going to do that. There is quite a lot more, but I won't give it to you now because otherwise it's just going to confuse you. But what do you think, Denny? I know you're listening. Oh, yeah. Um, I think you can kind of like appreciate and understand how like the, the mind reflects, but it's like the attachment and the stuff like that, say for example, like sitting meditating in the morning and a, and a thought comes up or something that I did right. like when I was a kid or a teenager and it just kind of like overwhelms you because of all the emotions coming and stuff like that. It's hard to kind of discern from, from what the mind's reflecting or, or coming Isn't up. Isn't it odd? I agree. So how do you do it? How do you start seeing it as it really is? How do you change that? It's quite simple, actually. Because I hear what you're saying exactly, but you change it because you start to develop awareness. And that awareness shows you the true nature of everything that gets expressed. None of it's tangible, none of it's permanent, none of it's you, none of it's anything. And when you start to, in the beginning, you go, yeah, 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 this is very interesting, this is very nice, and you sort of think about it a little bit and everything. But when you start to go from understanding it to experiencing it to realizing it, you're free of the wheel of life. You're free. You never have to come back unless by choice, and then you live in a different dimension completely. Mans, I know your 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 camera isn't working, but tell me what you think, because you've got always got good things to say. Hello, Mel. Yeah. Because you understand a lot of this, don't you? Um, it, it's like from the day I was born. Yes, I know. That's what I'm Yeah, yeah. But it's, and, it's really wonderful to hear your voice again because we have to keep on being reminded. Yeah. Why do we have to keep being reminded when living in that state would actually alleviate everything we're trying so hard to do. You yes. know, today, and you know, today I'm trying to say that all the things we are challenged with in our daily life, if you use the condition of the mirror, that it's only a reflection, you have a different attitude towards it. You're not so intense on cracking cracking it, doing this, doing that, doing the other, and getting it all right. You just stand back and you let it flow through you like a waterfall. It's a completely different way of being. Yeah. And so, but it's so difficult because of our conditioning. We just go back to that state so quickly. How yeah. would you? Or to really, and I know you understand this, man, from a long time ago, you already understood this. But you need to do it regularly to change your whole view and your whole everything. You need to do it regularly. Right, Tati? <laughs> what? What did you want to say? It's true, Mel. You have to, and I think 
because you constantly have to deal with the issues and the problems and the challenges, it keeps bringing you back, you know, it, to that moment of realizing it's all right. permanent. I allow it to bring me back. Yes. Because once you've got awareness, you don't have to allow it to bring you back. Mm. But when it does bring you back, you mm. can jump right back into the mirror in one minute when you carry that awareness in mm. your daily heart every single day so that yes I get pulled into situations I was pulled into a situation on the weekend but then after I was pulled into that situation whoops into my shrine room and then I took this little book and I was I was writing down the things that I had experienced I was writing them down and then I just suddenly saw how it works. And then I had a completely different attitude towards what I was saying. And that's how I'm trying to say with these three statements of Garib Dorje, that's wonderful, man. With these three statements, I want you to be able to apply them in your daily life. So yes, you jump right into the middle of all the crap, excuse my language, and then you're in it. But at some point in it, you go, wow, and you step back. So we have to end, everybody. I've got so much to teach you. I mean, it's unlimited. And now I've got um, Dilgo Kienzi stuff, which even makes it a lot richer. But I'm very grateful to give it, even if half the group aren't here, because I think it's really important. And what I am glad is that a lot of people are getting the recording, so they are carrying on with it, which is lucky. But the thing is that um, it's so important because it's changing me. And so then if I'm changed, I can give you what I learn and I can give you in my daily experience. And then you start and you do it and you'll pass the gift on to someone else and on and on and on. So let's end and then I will stay if anybody wants to ask or say anything, but let's just end, Boone, and devote it to all sentient beings and devote it to our South Africa has got to come right now. It's absolutely ridiculous. We can't allow hooligans to take over our country or anything else. We've got to put our light. And our light is for all of people in our country and for Ukraine and for the fall of all these, these negative egocentric beings who are certainly not working from the mirror of their nature of mind and all those suffering. Through this merit, may we achieve all seeing Buddhahood and thereafter, once all harmful enemies have been defeated, may all beings be liberated from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Sonam die tamche zipane topne nepe dranam pamshene chegana chibanap dropaye sipe sole do a Now I have to. I still haven't got it.